playing by the rules, water quality regulation, and animal agriculture. Today's presentation will cover the following. What are water quality concerns with agriculture? Which major set of water quality laws apply to animal agriculture? Who enforces or manages these laws? Federal, state, and local authority explanations will be covered. What types of ag operations are closely regulated and what is required? And who can provide you or producers with additional information? Water quality background. Since the 1970s, point sources of pollution have been addressed through regulations and improvements at industrial facilities and wastewater treatment plants. A point source of pollution is exactly as it sounds, it is a single identifiable source of water pollution. These were addressed very early in the Clean Water Act, once again, beginning in the early 70s. Agriculture is primarily tied to non-point sources of water pollution. Non-point source pollution is the collective runoff from an area as a result of rain or snow melt. In the image to the right, we see a plume of red clay soil in a reservoir in the southeastern United States. The soil was caused by erosion at a construction site, flowed off of the land, and collected in this water body. Pollutants connected to agricultural sources can be nutrients from manure and fertilizers, primarily nitrogen and phosphorus, sediment, pathogens, which are disease-causing organisms, pharmaceuticals from veterinary drugs, agricultural chemicals, and other compounds such as arsenic, which is associated with parasite control in the poultry industry. Possible areas or actual sources of water quality impacts from agriculture include animal confinement areas and lots, manure storage areas, chemical or fuel storage areas, silage pits, trenches, or silos, fields and farm roads, and where animals have direct access to surface water. water quality background, groundwater. What we're looking at here is the potential for pollutants to leach through the soil and get into aquifers or wells. Examples may include nitrates from the overapplication of fertilizer or manure on cropland, pathogens or pharmaceuticals from manure storage areas or manure application areas, as well as agricultural chemicals or fuels. This issue may be the greatest in areas with karst topography or very sandy soils, essentially in the sandy soils and the karst areas there are conduits or easy ways for pollutants to leach from the soil surface into wells or into groundwater. As far as farm animals are concerned, or as far as all animals are concerned, Livestock are not alone in contributing non-point sources of water pollution. In cities and urban areas, pet waste can cause water pollution. Where wildlife concentrate, there can also be water pollution. And septic systems and sewage also can contribute to this issue. Humans are people too. A little bit of humor there with our image of uh, cleaning up pet waste in an urban area. Regional impact of nutrient pollution. The hypoxic zone or dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico is an example of how nutrients from a very large area can move across the soil surface, leach through the soil, and reach a water supply. The Mississippi and Missouri basins collectively contribute nutrients to this area of the Gulf of Mexico. The resulting fertilization of this area causes algae to grow, and when it dies, it consumes oxygen during decomposition and causes a hypoxic area. This slide shows the contributions of nutrients in the Gulf of Mexico by state as of 2008. 
The states in darkest red contribute the most nutrients to the Mississippi Basin. At this point, you're welcome to break for a discussion. Consider these questions. Which of these pollutants are a concern for water quality in the area where you are located? What are the potential sources for these pollutants in the area where you are located? Consider both non-agricultural and agricultural sources. Think of specific facilities or industries in your community. What water quality rules are primarily faced by animal agriculture? As a bit of review, the Clean Water Act was originally passed in 1972. It was amended in 77 as well as 1987. The first issue the Clean Water Act addressed was point sources of pollution. The Clean Water Act is enforced by the federal government and or states, territories, and tribal entities. Most states in the United States have delegated authority from EPA to enforce the Clean Water Act within the boundaries of that state. The Clean Water Act primarily is concerned with surface water. Federal authority. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency has authority over the Clean Water Act. As previously mentioned, most states in the U.S. have authority delegated to them by the federal government to enforce the Clean Water Act within their state. The U.S. Department of Agriculture, though not regulatory in nature on this issue, provides technical and financial assistance related to controlling pollution. The Bureau of Land Management and Forest Service also oversee aspects of water quality in regards to federal grazing permits and leases. Most states and territories have the delegated authority. Some programs peripherally related to water quality are typically overseen by a state agricultural agency. Examples may include animal disease reporting, emergency planning and response, and animal mortality management. All of these issues may relate back to water quality. Tribal authority. Though located inside established states, the Native American tribes primarily work directly with EPA on environmental management and regulatory issues. States are usually not involved in regulating animal agriculture on these tribal lands. Local authority. There may be additional rules, laws, or simply zoning issues at the local, county, or city level. These may dictate where an agricultural facility is built. Often, these rules are driven by odor concerns much more than water quality concerns. Generally, these local rules apply to new or expanding operations, as existing operations are often grandfathered in. Soil and water conservation districts are also involved mostly through voluntary education and implementation of best management practices. They may include groundwater and wellhead protection programs, watershed plans. The soil and water conservation districts often carry out monitoring and similar to USDA provide financial and technical assistance. In some cases, the districts may have some regulatory authority. Clean Water Act and the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System. NPDES is a Clean Water Act program focused on point sources of pollution. Which ag activities are regulated? Animal feeding operations and concentrated animal feeding operations. The definition of an animal feeding operation is a place where animals have been are or will be confined for 45 days or more in a 12-month period. The area would have no crops, vegetation, forage, or post-harvest residues. Feed must be delivered to the animals in this area. The image to the right of the slide shows a fairly standard small 
beef confinement area in the American West. All nutrition is provided by feed imported to this area. This is a hard pack engineered lot that does not sustain plant growth. CAFO definition. Operations that meet the AFO definition described on the previous slide and the size threshold in red below are considered CAFOs, confined animal feeding operations. Those in the large or red category represent where EPA and delegated authority states generally require a permit. This may be subject to change due to ongoing court cases. However, the numbers of animals listed in the red column will largely remain a benchmark for permitting. The permit is an NPDES permit, though some states with delegated authority have renamed it. Additionally, some states require permits for the medium and even small categories. If an operation in the small or medium category is unpermitted and has a pollution discharge or a high probability to discharge, then they can be required to obtain a permit regardless of size. The size thresholds are meant to compare species on approximately a 1,000 pound basis. For example, an ideal fed steer will be about 1,000 pounds, but a dairy cow may be 1,200 to 1,400 pounds. Therefore, a dairy would be required to get a permit with fewer head than a beef feedlot. Compare this to a meat bird or a poultry broiler where the average chicken will finish around six pounds, a permit is generally not required until the threshold of 125,000 birds. In managing water quality for animal feeding operations, there are two major philosophies. These philosophies are what the permits and rules are based on. One, keep clean water clean. This means keeping as much clean water out of the production area as possible. You may gutter roof water, put up ditches and berms around the lot to prevent run on into the animal area. The second philosophy is to avoid direct contact between surface waters and manure, animals, or processed wastewater. The image to the right shows a cattle confinement area with a live creek running through the middle. This would be considered a violation in every state in the United States. Methods to keep clean water clean. Diverting clean water around lots. The image you see shows a grassy swale or shallow ditch that diverts snow melt and rainwater around the cattle lots. Guttering roofs is another management practice to prevent excess water in the production area. Properly maintaining waterers prevents additional water from leaking into the manure storage area or the lot. This image shows a variety of best management practices to protect water quality. Just to point out a few, number five is a grass filter strip. Any runoff that does come from the corral visible by the barns would be filtered and treated through an engineered grass area. Where cattle leave the confinement area to return to pasture, there is a proper stream crossing, number seven, and once in the pasture or in a range scenario, the cattle are fenced away from the water body. Preventing direct contact. The image you see below is an example of how you can retrofit an existing cattle lot to protect water quality. The yellow line represents where a new fence could be placed, allowing the area between the yellow line and the water body to be replanted with healthy grass and to serve as a filter area. The image you see here is a vegetated treatment area. Stormwater drains from the cattle lot on the right-hand side of the image into a shallow settling basin. From that point, the water discharges at several points across an engineered and specially planted vegetative treatment area. 
Manure management. It is very important to properly store collected manure. The three images we see here show two examples of liquid manure storage, like you might see at large dairy or a swine operation. And on the far right, we see a safe place to stack manure and spent bedding from a dry lot. Another method of protecting water quality and utilizing the value of manure is to spread the manure at an agronomic rate. That rate is based on the crop or forage need and the manure fertilizer value. This requires testing of manure and soil to determine initial nutrient values. An additional way to protect water quality is to not spread close to surface waters or areas of shallow groundwater. Generally speaking, if the area is grassed, 35 feet is a good setback for applying manure. Additionally, it is recommended to keep records documenting how the agronomic rate was calculated and the amount of manure fertilizer that was applied to the crop. Nutrient management plan. The concepts described on the previous slide essentially make up the bulk of a nutrient management plan. This plan defines the previously mentioned best management practices and manure handling practices. It is submitted as part of an operations permit. A consultant and or the producer can prepare such a plan. The USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service produces a comprehensive nutrient management plan. This plan is the first step in receiving cost share or grant dollars from this federal agency. The NRCS and a producer prepare the CNMP together. The CNMP usually contains more information than is required for a permit NMP. In many cases, animal feeding operations may have a CNMP already developed before their N permit NMP. Information from the CNMP can simply be transferred over to fill out the permit forms. Record keeping. Permitted operations must keep detailed records. Some of the most common areas that require observation and record keeping are the maintenance on clean water diversions and on manure storage structures, soil and manure test records, manure application records, and the calculations for agronomic rates. Additionally, any best management practice or BMP that protects water quality should be included in the records. Inspections. Frequency of inspections on animal feeding operation varies by state and EPA region. Generally speaking, a permitted animal feeding operation will be inspected at least once every one to three years. The purpose of the inspection is to verify that records are kept and the nutrient management plan is being followed. Physical observations that they may be made during an inspection include examination of outdoor facilities that handle manure or wastewater, manure storage areas, and possibly some of the land application areas where manure is applied as fertilizer. I hope all this information is not overwhelming. There are many sources of information to help producers as well as extension and agricultural educators. Seek information on these issues from Cooperative Extension, the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, your local conservation districts, Young Farmer Rancher Advisors, you can also learn from fellow producers, commodity associations, consultants that work with environmental management of animal agriculture, and the EPA's Ag Center, which is an online educational resource. In summary, confined animal operations are the most regulated sector of animal agriculture. Therefore, AFO and CAFO regulations are the most specific environmental rules that apply to animal agriculture. 
These rules are components of the Clean Water Act. Pasture and range operations are subject to very few specific environmental regulations. However, all agriculture, as well as all business and use on the land, may be subject to the broad provisions of the Clean Water Act. A variety of less specific environmental rules may still apply to animal agriculture.